Hello Info person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing some of the new discoveries and also some major confirmations in regards to quasars. Mysterious objects, very bright objects, and objects that originally confused the astronomers back in the 1950s because of their very strange properties. But the objects that eventually became extremely important for modern astronomy and for modern way of life. Mostly because of this. This is known as the quasar map, an extremely accurate astronomical map used in modern navigation. And though in the past we relied on things like stars or various constellations to try to figure out where we are, today technologies like for example GPS rely entirely on the quasars, as their position in the night skies is usually more or less constant and is known with extreme precision. But in this video we're going to discuss exactly what these objects are and what the scientists have recently confirmed. Well, I guess let's start with the obvious. What exactly is a quasar? What's behind the name? Well, because of their mysterious nature in the 50s, they became known as quasi-stellar objects. Or I guess more simply, strange stars. Objects that seem to be kind of like stars, but seem to emit very unusual frequencies that a lot of stars did not emit. Some of the earliest quasars were detected in radio light, and these were the brightest radio objects out there. And over time, within just a few years, the theory caught up with observations and the scientists were able to explain what they were looking at. Extremely powerful supermassive black holes, usually very far away, and usually with masses approaching millions or sometimes billions of solar masses, but always surrounded by a very powerful accretion disk, with various gas approaching the black hole closer and closer and through the process of friction would essentially create some of the brightest emissions in the entire universe with some of these objects being much more luminous than actual galaxies. For example, the only quasar you can technically see with a commercial telescope, 3C273, is approximately 4 trillion times more luminous than our Sun, and obviously much more luminous than the entire Milky Way as well. But the vast majority of quasars are only visible with much larger telescopes, and it wasn't until Hubble became operational that the scientists officially confirmed the nature of quasars as something located in the center of the galaxy. Or basically that it's something in the middle of the galaxy that's producing these emissions. And the only thing that made sense was a central black hole. And with more and more observations, quite a lot of these objects have been discovered and confirmed in the last few decades. Over a million quasars has been officially confirmed. With the object you see right here, known as Mercarian 231, being the closest quasar to us at approximately 600 million light years. One of the videos in the description describes this object and some of the discoveries about it a little bit better. But when it comes to some of the most distant ones, we actually do reach a bit of a limit because even their light is difficult to see. At the moment it's between ULS J1342 and this object you see right here, both objects located at the redshift of 7.5, or essentially when the universe was only about 690 million years old. But based on the discoveries from the new study, it's also quite likely that a lot of quasars did not exist before that. In about a minute I'll explain why. What's more important though, there's also a kind of a peak in the overall quasar observation when it comes to looking around quasars in distant universe. They seem to have peaked around the time known as the cosmic noon. One way to try to imagine what exactly this refers to is by looking at something like this. This essentially represents the timeline of the universe. And this of course assumes that the Big Bang actually happened and the universe expanded ever since. Here's a slightly different angle, created by National Science Foundation. Now on the left you see the oldest light, the cosmic microwave background. But eventually we have the first stars and even the first galaxies. A lot of this was discussed in previous videos on various discoveries by the James Webb. But around 2 to maybe 3 billion years after the Big Bang itself, we essentially reach a kind of a peak of star formation and also the period with the most brightness. Kind of similar to a typical noon on planet Earth. This is the time the universe was the brightest and the time we have the most stars and also the most quasars. And so the most quasars we observe around us were all from this period of time roughly around 10 billion years ago. And by itself this is an extremely important observation. It literally shows us that, that the Big Bang theory is most likely correct. It's practically impossible to explain this observation or this idea using any other theory, including the so-called steady-state theory, the one that assumes that the universe never changed. The only reasonable explanation for why there were so many quasars 10 billion years ago, but not so many today, with basically just one within about 600 million light years away from us, is really because of the way we believe the universe evolved in the last 14 billion years. 
And so these objects have definitely taught us quite a lot about the universe, are still teaching us even more today, but also have some important practical applications in modern day life. Not to mention that this is technically also some of the most efficient ways of converting mass into energy in the entire universe. The reason they're so bright and the reason they produce so much luminosity is because of an extremely efficient way these huge black holes are able to convert the energy through the process of friction. And so, for example, inside our sun, the nuclear fusion process is only about like 0.7% efficient when it comes to producing energy from the mass itself. This is normally known as proton-proton chain nuclear fusion, and that's of course the process responsible for the energy in our sun. Here though, the efficiency is way higher, anywhere between 6 to possibly 32%. Which basically means that, hypothetically, if there's someone out there that wants to extract energy extremely efficiently, they would probably do so from quasars and not from stars or anything else. Some of these objects are so bright that they would kind of appear similar to our sun from a distance of about 100 light years away from planet Earth. And because of the efficiency of mass absorption, they can maintain this brightness for millions of years. Although the thing is, they're mostly bright from this angle, not so much from the side. And so this unusual directionality technically can actually make them perfect engines for production of energy. But we'll talk more about this in some of the future videos on the Fermi Paradox, the playlist for which you can find in the description below. But because of these unusual features and because of this efficiency, and of course their prominence approximately 10 billion years ago, the scientists wanted to finally confirm, so what exactly produces these objects? Why is it that only some galaxies end up having them? And what exactly initiates this process of converting so much mass into so much energy? Now, a lot of the modern studies usually focus on the nearby galaxy of M87, the one that the scientists recently used to create this beautiful picture of both the central black hole and the resulting jet. We'll actually discuss some of these updates in the video in the description. But even here, the scientists are not certain what started all of this. And also this particular galaxy is not really as bright as some of the other quasars out there. And to try to answer the questions of their origin, or understand where these objects might have come from, the scientists wanted to look at some of the stranger or rarer type of quasars, such as the one you see right here, dual quasars. Here's what they probably look like. This is the one that was recently found during the cosmic noon, the dual quasar known as G0749 plus 2255. Now, these dual quasars were initially believed to be kind of rare, but the scientists behind a recent study took a look at 48 different galaxies containing quasars and compared them to 100 different non-quasar galaxies in the process trying to figure out if there are any major differences that can confirm their origin. For the most part, all of these were also extremely far away, mostly located at the cosmic noon. But by observing these 150 galaxies, they found obvious differences in their properties. The galaxies with quasars contain various distorted structures in the outer regions, whereas the galaxies without quasars, for the most part, were not really disturbed and were more or less symmetrical, which led the scientists behind this paper to a pretty obvious conclusion. Galaxies with quasars were about three times more likely to be interacting or colliding as opposed to more quiet, distant galaxies that did not produce quasar-like emissions. With the main confirmation being something that the scientists believed for a very long time, quasars are most likely produced through the process of galactic collision. And more importantly, this directly confirms and connects several different ideas and several different theories. First of all, this is once again a major confirmation for the Big Bang Theory. Cosmic Noon was the time of most galactic collisions, because that's the time when most galaxies were growing in size, becoming larger and larger over time, and acquiring more mass which would also obviously lead to more star formation, making this period extremely bright. And when two galaxies collide and push huge amounts of gas toward one another, quite a lot of this gas ends up in the center, captured and consumed by the central black hole in the middle, which ends up releasing huge amounts of energy for a very long time. And though in many cases the black holes collide, creating something larger in the middle, in some cases it does create two smaller quasars orbiting around one another although this type of quasar is extremely rare, which implies that this is maybe how many massive black holes became more massive over time. But because these galaxies were so powerful and so many collisions happened all at once, this may also imply that this particular period of time was not very friendly to life. 
it's actually quite unlikely that a lot of life would have survived during this period, because a lot of these emissions are ridiculously powerful, and during the cosmic noon, the overall radiation from everywhere was just a little bit too extreme. But that's of course an assumption that we cannot prove just yet. What we can prove, of course, is the fact that it was only about 6 to 7 billion years after the cosmic noon that the life on Earth started to evolve. With Earth becoming the way it is today, by being in a very unique position in a somewhat quiet, somewhat shy galaxy that's not particularly active. And that most likely did not go through these very powerful emission stages and might have never really been a quasar. Now we know that the Milky Way did have some major emissions coming from the center, as a matter of fact we can even see signs of them in the famous Fermi bubbles that you see right here, but it's quite likely that these emissions were incomparable in power to what happens inside quasars. And so there's actually a high chance that our galaxy, the Milky Way, was very likely very quiet for billions of years, at least ever since the existence of planet Earth. But this may not last. Assuming that the analysis from this study is correct, there's a really high chance that the galaxy we live in will become a quasar in a somewhat distant future. In the next few billions of years, possibly 4 to 5 billion years, the Andromeda and the Milky Way will most likely collide head-on and will most likely initiate the quasar stage of these two galaxies. It's unclear exactly what they're going to become just yet, but the overall emissions in the center of both galaxies are probably going to increase dramatically. And assuming that quasars are as powerful as we think they are, it might sort of be the end for complex life in our galaxy. At least for some time. But obviously this is a pretty big assumption, and mostly based on our ideas about life and how life evolves. We don't really know exactly what's going to happen, and obviously in 5 billion years, planet Earth is not going to be particularly hospitable to life for other reasons. Check out some of the videos in the description to learn a little bit more about this. Anyway, on that note, well, that's pretty much all I wanted to mention. Exciting confirmations, exciting discoveries, and another exciting reason to talk about quasars. But for now, that's kind of all we know. Once the scientists figure out something else about these unusual objects, I'll follow this up with the next video. Thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, and maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.